and a warm welcome to today's edition of Patcast. Today is Tuesday, January 23rd, 2024. I'm Rifat Mannan in California. Uh, we are very delighted to welcome today Dr. Shabnam Jaffer, who needs no introduction to those who practice breast pathology. Uh, Dr. Jaffer is professor of pathology at Jakar School of Medicine at Hofstra University, Northwell Health in New York. And she is also the chair of the Department of Pathology at uh, Lenox Hill Hospital in New York. And today she is going to deliver a talk on breast pathology. And the title of her talk is Destiny of HER2 New in the Era of HER2 Low in 2024. And as you are aware, this is a very uh, um, hot topic in breast pathology nowadays. I think uh, this is the right person to talk about it uh, as we deal with this uh, new entity or new concept in breast uh, pathology or breast reporting. So over to you, Dr. Jaffer, and thanks for joining us today. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much for the kind words and invitation. Uh, given that it's still January, I'm going to start by wishing everybody a happy new year. And then I'm going to take you back to 1999 It seems you are that... muted. Sorry, Dr. Jaffer, your mic microphone, can you take? Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. It's fine. Okay, so Thanks. I'll take you back to 1999, the year that we went from the traditional classification of breast cancer as we know it and use it till today, in that we divide cancers into in situ and invasive and by morphology, ductal versus lobular. At an IHC level, this translates to ER positive, ER negative, HER2 positive and HER2 negative, or both. In 1999, this was more elegantly demonstrated. Um, trying to see if my, okay, yeah. This was more elegantly um, demonstrated by the landmark study, molecular study published by Peru et al. that revolutionized our method of classifying breast cancers into categories such as basal, luminal, and HER2 positive. For the purpose of this talk, I will concentrate on the HER2 positive cancers which comprise approximately 15 to 20% of all breast cancers characterized by HER2 gene overexpression and amplification. So on this next slide, we see that the HER2 gene is a receptor tyrannies protein kinase encoded by the ERB2 gene on chromosome 17Q12. It comprises membrane receptors that dimerize and phosphorylate to enable signal transduction from the cell exterior to the nucleus, resulting in angiogenesis, invasion, and aggressive behavior, resulting in poorly differentiated cancers and sometimes metastasis to the brain. As seen on this graph, HER2 is both prognostic and predictive. On the left-hand side, you can see that HER2 is associated, HER2 positive is associated with poorer survival, whereas on the right side, Paradoxically, HER2 also confers advantage in terms of improved survival from targeted therapy. The armamentarium of HER2 targeted therapy continues to grow and can be divided into three big categories. The monoclonal antibodies that target the external domain of HER2 seen on the left, which comprises of tyrosine kinase inhibitors that block receptors HER2-1 and 2, the antibody drug conjugates such as TDM1, and we will talk about TDXD today. And then you see on the right hand side the newer kids on the block, the bispecific antibodies, which, as the name suggests, block two receptors, HER2 and HER3. And then we have vaccines which use immunogenic models. So HER2 was born in 1935 from HERB2, and the phrase new was actually derived from a neuroblastoma mouse cell line model with homology to EGFR and led to the discovery of the HER2 new molecule on chromosome 17. As we look at the progression chart for HER2, the key milestones are 1998, when trastuzumab was used as first line of anti-HER2 targeted therapy, followed by lapatinib in 2007, at which time the first formulary formally regulated ASCO-CAP guidelines were standardized, 
followed by changes in 2013 and 18. The ASCO CAP HER2 FISH and IC guidelines are based on two mutually exclusive methods the detection at the receptor level through the protein overexpression via IHC versus nuclear amplification at a cytogenetic level detected by a fluorescent in situ hybridization. And there are separate algorithms for IHC and FISH for diagnostic purposes. When assessing HER2 IHC, the first task is to evaluate for the presence or absence of membranous staining and if present, to determine if it's complete or incomplete. Over the years, the ASCO CAP guidelines have undergone changes in description. For instance, we went from positivity being strong positive staining in greater than 30% of cells to greater than 10% of cells in 2013. There have also been changes in how we interpret ratios and more recently to the creation of groups um, as shown here. The current ASCO algorithm is structured to be binary, however. It's either positive or negative. This is because many of the first generational HER2 targeted therapies as enlisted in these trials were beneficial exclusively for patients with HER2 positive disease. Thus, the pathologist had no incentive to further subclassify HER2 values in detail. However, few new trials show efficacy of new drugs in cases of low HER2 expression. In particular, the DESTINY BREST-04 trial showed that compared to chemo, trastuzumab deruxtecan, which I will call TDXD, given its long name from here on, significantly prolonged progression-free and overall survival among previously treated patients with HER2 low metastatic breast cancers, regardless of hormone receptor status. So how do we define HER2 low? This definition has caused a paradigm shift in the binary classification of HER2 evaluation. If we revisit the original CAP algorithm, HER2 low is defined as HER2 1 plus or 2 plus, that is FISH negative, as shown by the highlighted area in the algorithm right here. So this would be the wastebasket group. The success of the DESTINY BREST-04 trial lies in the ability of TDXD to transport the toxin TP1 to the nucleus where it is enzymatically cleaved and internalized to exert its effect on cells that are HER2 positive or HER2 low. Then there is a release of toxin that affects neighboring cells that is equivalent to a bystander or permeable payload effect. You can imagine this as a Trojan horse delivery in that the drug binds to the external receptor, gets internalized, and then a payload occurs. Immediately after the release of the impactful Destiny B04 trial, TDXD was approved and endorsed by the FDA and the NCCN for patients with recurrent or metastatic disease that were hurt too low. So if we look back at our pie chart, if we simply divide breast cancer into HER2 plus and negative, this is what we would see. But then if we apply the HER2 low definition, you can see that you start getting a shift in the pie chart um, with an area that now shows you the HER2 1 plus, 2 plus, comprising about 60% on the chart. Um, and then we see a third category of HER2 low emerge. And this can be either HER2 low Luminal or HER2, which is ER positive or triple negative, which means that these tumors are very heterogeneous at a morphologic, immunohistochemical, and molecular level, including clinical level. The results of the Destiny BO4 trial have made it crucial for us to recognize the HER2 low category. And this spurred the much awaited ASCO CAP update that was released about a year ago. The bottom line of this update was basically the recommendations and the best practices. The recommendations, as you see here, reaffirmed the 2018 criteria. So 
So you can see that there are no, no new changes were made in the scoring criteria. The authors felt that it was premature to create a HER2 low label since, as I showed you before, it does not represent a distinct biologic entity. It lacks unique molecular and clinical pathologic features, and in actuality, is just a specific therapeutic subgroup that is clinically significant due to its drug eligibility. So how do they recommend dealing with this entity? They recommend using a footnote in HER2 IHC evaluation that goes beyond the dichotomous classification of HER2 by stating, and I quote, patients, and I'm, I'm quoting the, the footnote here, patients with breast cancers that are HER2 IHC 3 plus or IHC 2 plus ish amplified may be eligible for several therapies that disrupt HER2 signaling pathways. Invasive breast cancers that test HER2 negative, meaning that they are IHC 0, 1 plus, or 2 plus that is not amplified by ish, are more specifically considered HER2 negative for protein overexpression or gene amplifications since non-overexpressed levels of the HER2 protein may be present in these cases. Patients with breast cancer that are HER2 IHC 1 plus or IHC 2 plus ish not amplified may be eligible for a treatment that targets non-amplified or non-overexpressed levels of HER2 expression by, for cytotoxic drug delivery. IHC 0 re results do not result in eligibility currently. Similarly, few days prior to this publication, the updated CAP synoptic biomarker templates issued a footnote acknowledging the HER2 low entity by stating, and I quote again, breast cancers with HER2 IHC score 1 plus or HER2 IHC score 2 plus and a negative ish result are eligible for clinically appropriated HER2 tar targeted therapy and may be reported as HER2 low. So going back to the ASCO CAP update, we will discuss now in detail the best practice updates for distinguishing zero from one plus. So we will discuss each of these as we go. First, examining HER2 IHC stained slides using standardized ASCO CAP guideline scoring criteria. For this, we use the ASCO CAP criteria in, as shown here in algorithm form as instituted in 2018 with no new changes to this scoring. Second, examining HER2 IHC at high power for, at 40X to help discriminate zero from one plus. My recommendation for this is that HER2 IHC interpretation should be approached in a two-pronged fa fashion, qualitative and quantitative, keeping in mind that the 10% cutoff is crucial. It is important for the pathologist to first scan the HNE slide at low power for determining percentage and then hone in at high power to determine strength of membranous staining. As you can see, the HER2 IHC result is inversely related to the magnitude necessary to determine score. For example, a positive score can be easily appreciated at low power, 4x, but as the strength of the staining decreases, meaning if you go to 2 plus, 1 plus, and 0 plus, and 0, the magnitude needed to determine it increases. So to, to discriminate from 0 from 1 plus, it is now incumbent that the pathologist use 40x, high power. But despite well-defined criteria, scoring HER2 IHC can be tricky business as seen by this round robin study, which analyzed the inter-observer variability of HER2 IHC interpretation. In this study, which used 18 pathologists um, who scanned slide from a selected set of breast cancer biopsies using a four point scale, they found that there was only a 26% concordance for distinguishing zero from one plus compared with 58% concordance between two plus 
and C plus. This is because interpretation is operator level dependent and subjective, requiring skill and experience. However, the pathologists admitted after the results were published that they weren't aware of the importance of distinguishing between the low scores and would have performed better had they been more vigilant. So what, what happens if you educate and inform the pathologist? Will the results get better? It's been done. This is a recent study looking at um, concordance after you educate and inform pathologists about scoring and being uh, very mindful of the, especially the lower end spectrum of the scores. And what we learned from this study that yes, the results got better, but still, it, it seems like we need more accurate and reproducible methods for selecting patients who may benefit from the newly approved HER2 targeting agents on HER2 low breast cancers. So while we, while we improved, we did not achieve perfection. There's no doubt that HER2 IHC is limited. Its disadvantages including limited dynamic range, sensitivity to variables, its semi-quantitative nature, and being that it is observer dependent. So what future alternatives can we use to detect HER2 low that goes beyond the microscopic level? We need more sensitive and quantitative IHC assay. We need HER2 quantitative image analysis, RTQPCR, targeted mass spectrometry, and immunofluorescence. And all these are happening at a research level. They, they are not quite there, um, even though PAGE has had its AI um, uh, evaluation of HER2 FDA approved. So in the future, we see more and more of these getting approved for evaluation of HER2 that is more sensitive and goes beyond what we can see at a microscopic level, which might be important as I discuss more trials. But for now, all we have is IHC. So let's make the most of it. The ASCO CAP update advocates to consider second pathologist review in all challenging borderline cases for distinguishing zero and one plus and to seek consensus when necessary. I prefer internal consensus because an in-house consult allows for no interlab variation, faster turnaround time, and promotes consistency. But if it's, this is not achievable, then sending it to your other colleagues, maybe at other institutions who are experts in breast pathology may be a viable option. In a crucial case, it may be necessary to test a second blocks uh, and, and more blocks because it may not be a bad idea in a heterogeneous case where the results may vary. And if the results are crucial to the oncologist, it may be important to entertain the idea to test it out on other blocks. And we will talk about heterogeneity shortly. Fourth, the CAP, ASCO CAP ad, uh, guidelines advocate use, using controls with the entire range of protein expression, 0, 1 plus, 2 plus, 3 plus, to ensure adequate sensitivity at low range and appropriate limit of detection of the assay. Now, whenever you are um, using controls, it's important to use the same QA measures. And this includes using internal and external controls, both as batches and on slides, running a minimum of 40 challenging cases to validate your controls, using 20 positive and negative cases to achieve greater than 90% concordance. It's important to track your HER2 low rates with those published in the literature so that you may assess for drifts in assay performance and operator competency. It is important to validate your HER2 IHC assays with proficiency and competency. And I look forward to a future where we can have proficiency tests that can consider the entire spectrum of HER2, including HER2 low cases. The fifth rule advocated by ASCO CAP guidelines is to pay careful attention to pre-analytic conditions. These include 
ensuring that you have an adequate sample for HER2 testing, meaning that you have more than 50 invasive carcinoma cells that suffer from no severe processing or crush artifact, that you're able to visualize them very well. You minimize cold ischemic time to less than 60% to preserve, so that the tissue is preserved and antigen preservation is retained. To standardize tissue fixation using 10% neutral buffered formalin, and this can range from six to 72 hours at max. Avoid specimens that are decalcified whenever possible. And if you are to decalcify, use EDTA. Pictures are louder than words, and I hope these images from a recent publication stress the effect of cold ischemia time on IHC results. The top left box showing preservation of the immunohistochemical stain HER2 due to quick fixation, but then you see a progression due to lack therefore, three hours, 24 hours, and 48 hours, where you start getting a change in your HER2 IHC reading to the point where it's negative at 48 hours. It is important to stress that these analytic conditions should not only be observed in breast, but also something that we forget is in the metastatic samples that you're going to be working up, um, uh, ruling out breast cancer and staining for HER2 IHC. And thus you should make your oncologist aware when they're giving you samples to make sure that they follow these um, ischemic guidelines, pre-fixation, pre uh, uh, pre-ischemic and fixation guidelines. Because medical oncologists may consider HER2 IHC results on prior or concurrent primary sam samples in other metastatic sites as well, because there may be heterogeneity in HER2 expression levels between samples and because metastatic cancer tissue samples may suffer from pre-analytic conditions that are not as well monitored as in primary breast tissue samples. So let's discuss prior HER2 results. Because once the HER2 uh, Destiny B04 trial was released, the results, a lot of us saw a flurry of requests from our oncologists to go back to our historic specimens and check out the HER2 values there. It's important when you're looking at the older reports or slides to see what ASCO CAP HER2 criteria were used at the time of reporting. Since I mentioned to you that the guidelines had changed uh, as far as three plus um, percentage, as far as ratios, as far as groups. So look at the reports and, and make sure what year the criteria was used and if it affected your results. Keep in mind that archived slides may fade or develop artifacts over time. So interpret these with caution. In case of doubt, it is better to repeat stains on freshly cut slides um, and try to avoid testing on archived pre-cut unstained slides that are greater than six weeks because they may be antigen decay as a, re as a result of time. It's also important which antibody clone and methodology was used. So as far as HER2 IHC clones, the clone does influence the identification of HER2. Different antibodies use different detection and retrieval systems, um, but the literature shows fair to moderate agreement. There are several FDA approved IHC assays that are cleared and used primarily for identifying HER2 positive disease, but discrimination in the low end is less well defined. For the purposes of um, the Destiny B04 trial, you should be aware that the approved companion diagnostic test that is FDA approved is the 4B5. There are other HER2 clones that are comparable, um, but I would re recommend that you stick to the 4B5 if you can. Now let's get to HER2 heterogeneity that I've been promising that we will talk about. What is the definition of HER2 heterogeneity? As the name suggests, it's the opposite of heterogeneity, meaning that the evaluation is not homogeneous. It is defined by the coexistence of multiple tumor cell subpopulations 
with distinct HER2 status within the same tumor. By ASCOCAP 2013 guidelines, HER2 heterogeneity is defined as the presence of a separate population of cells with a different HER2 copy number and or HER2 CEP17 ratio accounting for at least 10%, but less than 50% of the overall tumor population. There is a high prevalence observed in HER2 low breast cancers, and thus it can impact concordance and reliability, compromising the identification of HER2 low breast cancer cancers, which has treatment implications. So here's an example of what I mean um, as far as HER2 heterogeneity. We have a tumor seen in three different panes. Morphologically on the top by, by H&E, they are more completely similar to identical. However, at an IHC level, you can see that the um, reading, the score, shifts or ranges from one plus on the right to two plus in the middle to being three plus as, as shown by the three plus strong straining in greater than 10% of cells. This is also observed, the variability is also observed with HER2 fish, where you can see on the right, there is a nice one-to-one -one ratio between the red and the green signal, which steadily increases to the point where you get to the left pane and it is amplified as seen by the greater red signals of the HER2 compared to the CEP17. HER2 heterogeneity may also be temporal, which means that it can change, it can, it can be variable from the primary core biopsy to the primary excision, to seeing it even in the concurrent axillary lymph node metastases, to after treatment, be it neoadjuvant, chemo or endocrine therapy, to recurrence, and to finally metastases, even multiple metastases. And why does this happen? Why does HER2 status change over time? It could be due to many reasons, which we'll go over. First, sampling error. You may be seeing a core biopsy versus an excision. And as I demonstrated with the HER2 heterogeneous, heterogeneous case, um, if it is a heterogeneous tumor, it depends what you were seeing at what point in the patient's tumor journey, which is the second point that I'm uh, pointing out here, which is intra tumoral heterogeneity. Then there may be pre-analytic variables that I demonstrated with the picture that if there is a, dis a discrepancy between how they were observed, they may lead to discrepant results of HER2 between specimens. Espe we see this especially between core biopsy and excision because the core biopsy being that it's small, um, the, the pre-analytic variables are, are able to be met very quickly given the small volume of tissue that's retrieved in achieving the um, whole ischemic time and the fixation times, whereas with a gross specimen, you have to ensure that it is A, received in a timely fashion in your lab if it's received fresh, it is then grossly cut right away and immersed in formalin. And there are challenges to doing this, but these challenges need to be met and the obstacles need to be identified so that you can eliminate the problems associated with it so that your HER2 IHC rates are as good as that seen on core bites. Lastly, the tumor itself may change um, from, the, from one point in the patient's journey to another, and the HER2 may also change as a result. Thus, testing HER2 during a patient's cancer journey is important and impacts treatment decisions. So which specimen should we use for determining a patient's HER2 status? I, I would say, Test as many as possible, whichever one is going to impact on the patient's eligibility for becoming HER2 positive. We define HER2 positivity as any HER2 positive during the patient's uh, journey with cancer. Now let's look at the change from core biopsy to excision. For now, as per ASCO CAP guidelines, we perform biomarkers on primary breast cancers, preferably on core biopsies as recommended at, by ESCOCAP guidelines, and only repeated on excision under 
special circumstances. In 2013, the circumstances were said, you know, you, you were supposed, you were mandated to repeat them if negative on core biopsy. But that was changed in 2018 um, to say that you had a choice in, chain, in uh, repeating them on excision, um, particularly when you, or, or, or you were mandated only if you had these conditions, um, if the tumor was grade three, if the amount of invasive tumor in the core biopsy specimen was small, if the resection specimen contains high-grade carcinoma that is morphologically distinct from that in the core, if the core biopsy result is equivocal for HER2 after testing by both ISH and IHC, and if there's any doubt about the handling of the core biopsy specimen, um, be it long ischemic time, short time in fixative, different fixatives used, I would even say different antibodies used, or the test is suspected by the pathologist to be negative on the basis of testing error. In light of the fact that HER2 may change for reasons that we already mentioned, in the era of HER2 low, it may be prudent to repeat IHC testing of all negative values on core biopsy on excision, especially if your, I, if your oncologist is knocking on your door trying to find criteria that may, pay, may make the patient eligible for treatment in, in somebody who has failed several forms of other treatments. A recent publication looking at this, meaning the concordance between HER2 low on core biopsy versus excision, showed actually an alarming late rate of 50% um, gain in HER2 low status on excision compared to core biopsy. Um, we did the same kind of study when I was at Mount Sinai, and um, we actually did not see such a, such a dramatic um, change in the value. We only saw an upstage in HER2 status between core biopsy and excision in 10% of, in 11% of cases, which makes me a little um, comfortable, uh, co comforting in saying that the core biopsy is actually quite good in giving us an accurate window into the HER2 low status. It may be worthwhile in 10% of cases to repeat it. And again, it, it depends on how desperate the situation is in that the oncologist is seeking treatment for a patient who is eligible for treatment with TBXD. Studies looking at the concordance between HER2 IHC on primary versus metastases versus recurrence show that for the most part, HER2 scores remain stable in the evolution of the disease, but in a significant 30 to 40% of cases, there may be dynamic increased expression, mostly due to conversion from HER2 zero to HER2 low and less, less so in the opposite distance direction, further stressing the need to test metastases. Again, in, in, my, in a study that I did um, with my team at Mount Sinai, we found a concordance per to low rate um, of 59% with potential meaningful differences in her to low therapy in only 28% of cases. Again, stressing that it is important to test metastases not just one metastasis, but even multiple metastases, as we recently pub published uh, in this study with Dr. Bardwaj, where we saw that the concordance rate of HER2 IHC scores decreased from the primary to the first, second, and third, or increased in some cases from um, HER2 zero to low in up to 21% of cases from the primary to the MEX. So every time a pre patient presents with a new metastasis, it is important to test each metastasis because of the discrepancy that may be seen in a small percentage of cases. It uh, again stresses the importance of testing any new metastasis in a patient's journey with HER2 zero cancer due to the existence of intrapatient intermetastasis heterogeneity of HER2. This brings me to the last clinical trial that I will discuss, and that is the DAISY trial. In this trial, patients treated with TBEXD showed response rates um, that were particularly high in HER2 positive, 
and HER2 low, but similar results to HER2 low in even HER2 zero uh, cases, which provokes the question as to what are the reasons for this HER2 zero response rate. A, it, I'm going to go over these three reasons. One, maybe we were dealing with what we call ultra low HER2 expression. And by that, we mean, um, as seen here in the bottom, not HER2, HER2 negative can be divided into being dead negative with no membrane staining, meaning totally zero, nothing seen at an IHC level, versus when you see a little bit of staining, which we call faint, barely perceptible expression in, um, as, we, as we interpret as one plus, in less than 10% of tumor cells. Um, and this is also being investigated in the Destiny Breast 6 trial. So this is what we call the HER2 low, HER2 ultra low. So maybe these tumors were ultra low, and maybe we need a more sensitive test that I, I, I mentioned all the different um, methodologies that are out there to try to detect and measure HER2 at a subcellular level that is beyond the naked eye at a microscopic uh, IHC and fish level. Secondly, it could be discrepancies, as I mentioned be before, variability. Um, between one specimen to another with regards to pre-analytic variables, interpretation, clone, heterogeneity, and sampling error. Maybe these were not really HER2 zeros, uh, but it depends which specimen you were doing and which variable affected it. And finally, maybe TDXD is an amazing drug that has a payload effect that cures even HER2 zero patients. And we will see as we anxiously await the results of Destiny B06 to see if this payload effect is really as remarkable and as impactful. Um, but we have to wait as the results uh, accumulate and uh, come back on this trial. So how should a HER2 IHC report look like in 2024? It's no longer enough for a pathologist to just say HER2 negative. The report must have details and granularity as to whether the negativity is zero or one plus. So you start with a score. And then the next aspect is the percentage of cell staining. And as I pointed out, the 10% cutoff is very crucial in distinguishing between a zero and a one plus as far as the, the intensity of staining. And again, it's crucial for a three plus. So the, all these 10 plus cutoffs are very important. Then you, you must, when looking at staining intensity, determine if the membrane of staining is complete or incomplete, and this should also be in your report. Is the staining faint, barely perceptible, weak, moderate, strong? This again goes, goes back to the zero, one plus, two plus, three plus. Keep in mind that all the two pluses must have fish done. And that this should be on your report as pending. It's important to mention which antibody clone you have used. And as I mentioned, the 4B5 is the FDA approved, and that was the companion diagnostic test used in the Destiny B04 trial. You must mention your cold ischemic time, which should be less than one hour. You must mention your fixation time, which should be less than 72 hours, but no more than six hours, no less than six hours. And then if it was a challenging case that required you to look at, at with a breast pathologist or with another pathologist, you should also put that in the report that a, a, a consensus was performed. And while the update advocates um, doing a consensus for zero to one plus cases, in my own personal experience, I sometimes need a second opinion on a, on a case that I can't decide if it's two plus, three plus in percentage. So in breast, as we know, there's always a need for a consensus in challenging cases. So don't be shy to do it and to report it. And finally, you should use a footnote as per recommendation by 2023 ASCO CAP guidelines. It could be the one that was uh, advocated by the ASCO CAP guidelines um, that I mentioned, or if you prefer the CAP synoptic template footnote, which specifically mentions the HER2 low label in a grid fashion. And um, I think it makes it easier for your oncologist to be able to see the HER2 low label and to be able to identify it. That is something that 
you will have to make the choice what is better for your service and your practice. In closing, I'd like to end by sharing a picture of this momentous event at the ASCO plenary session in June 2021 in Chicago, where the results of the Destiny BO4 trial received a standing ovation. The results were felt to be so impactful that it was reported as being the next best thing to chemotherapy in the breast. I hope I've given you a quick highlight of the breast updates as um, outlined in the ASCO CAP guideline um, that was published last year and a little bit of my opinion and uh, my uh, the way I use it in my practice. Thank you for your time and attention and I'm open for any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Jaffer, for this uh, very enlightening session on heart to lower breast cancers and uh, the guidelines and what are your own experience and the tips for reporting as well. Uh, there are some questions online, so let me uh, read them for you. There is one yeah. question that I saw is that, so does it mean that heart to low is a new subtype of breast cancer? So what is your opinion on that? I don't think HER2 is a new subtype of breast cancer. And I think I tried to show it in the pie charts that we just basically took a, a chunk of the of the HER2 um, negative cases and the HER2 2 plus and we combined it. It's not a new biologic entity. Um, it's something that we've always seen, but we just haven't given it the label, which is HER2 uh, 1 plus and HER2 2 plus, which fish negative. And as I showed you, it is also heterogeneous in that the cases may be luminal or they may tr be tri triple negative. Um, there have been a lot of papers in the recent literature trying to examine their clinical, clinical pathologic features, uh, their molecular features, and there is a back and forth. Some people believe that they do have um, specific features, but overall, most papers are showing that it is heterogeneous. Um, that we can't really put a specific finding to them. So I believe it's not something new. Um, uh, it's, it's, a, just a, it's just a label that we use for a, a group of patients that will benefit from a specific therapeutic uh, regimen. Right. Uh, thank you so much. I think you have mentioned quite a few times about the tumor heterogeneity and scoring heterogeneity. So there was one question early on uh, from one of our colleagues that to share your experience about uh, how to heterogeneity. So I probably you might have touched upon that quite a few times, but still, if you want to add anything, please feel free. So heterogeneous tumors are very challenging because it depends how they change from core biopsy to excision to metastasis to metastatic tumors. When we start with the core biopsy, we're only getting a glimpse of it. And for the most part, as I showed you, in uh, as the literature also shows, in about 60% of cases, we're going to be accurate with our HER2 IHC score on core biopsy uh, and then the next specimen that comes. But because they can be um, tumors that have these different clones, um, as I showed on that tri-panel, where morphologically to our eye, they look identical. But on an IHC level, they may be areas that are um, zero to one plus to two plus to three plus. And we've even demonstrated that at a uh, cytogenetic level where even the fish um, may look different. I find this especially challenging when I'm um, evaluating HER2 on four biopsies where I see strong positive staining but it's in a small percentage of the tumor. And it becomes difficult to then say, is this 10% of the tumor or not, given that you're only seeing a small, um, you know, small window uh, span of the tumor. Um, in those cases, I find that it is important if you are going to do fish to, def document, to, to see it, or even if you have a HER2 case that you want to be fished, it's important to, mark that area that you want fish to be done because that may change in different areas um, at a cytogenetic level. So whenever you have a HER2 heterogeneous case and you're going to do fish on it, 
try to tell your cytogeneticist to study that HER2 at a molecular level, on, uh, at a fish level, on that area. Because these are very challenging cases, not only for us, but also for the oncologists when we give them results that a tumor is heter HER2 heterogeneous. Um, for them, the treatment is also um, uh, ch challenging. I've had a few cases now where you know the HER2 positive component was uh, was not diffuse, um, you know, ranging from greater than ten percent, which we call positive, to forty or fifty percent. Um, and when and over long term follow up, these patients do not respond as well to anti HER2 agents as other patients that are diffusely and HER2 three plus positive, uh, because these tumors are maybe different and. Um, what I'm trying to say is that they are challenging both for us and for the patient's treatment for the oncologist. Thank you, Dr. Jaffer. I think you have uh, raised a very valid point that, you know, we need to circle that specific area of the tumor where actually we might want to uh, want like to do fish, right? Because otherwise, if that is not, and which is something that can be easily done, which will uh, improve our uh, results on HER2 reporting, especially on fish. And as you said, that it can be heterogeneous. And if that focus is not selected, so maybe they will take other areas and again, the result will be different. Yes. So with that, there are a couple of more questions. Let me read you one more for, for you. Uh, that Do you do fish on uh, one plus immunostain cases? So no, I don't do it at my present institution. Um, there are some oncologists uh, um, that I've heard in other institutions that want it because, especially in poorly differentiated tumors, because again, they're afraid of this heterogeneity. Um, I actually had an abstract where we looked at um, HER2 one plus cases that were fished. And what we found was there was um, amplification in less than 1% of cases, which you know, then makes you question, is it worth testing every HER2 one plus um, at a cytogenetic level? The yield is extremely low. Um, and so at, at the current time, ASCO cap guidelines do not advocate it. It's we only do fish in two plus cases. But you know, as you know in science, there are no absolutes, and I'm not surprised that a very, very small percentage of HER2 one plus cases will have amplification. Whether these patients will benefit from anti-HER2 targeted therapies, we don't know. You know, is, is it important to treat a patient based on the protein level or the site of genetic level? These are questions that we still don't know the answers for. Um, and, and that's why we, we keep doing the studies to understand it better. Thank you again. Uh, there is a long question from one of our colleagues. Let me read it for you. Sure. Uh, when the original HAR2 IAC were validated, most labs won't have optimized or titrated their antibodies for differentiating 0 and 1 plus, as both were considered negative. Can we rely on those titrations for us to reliably differentiate HAR2 0 and 1 plus? which can have significant impact on potential therapeutic selection. I hope I, I was clear. Yeah. This is, as I said, as soon as the um, Destiny Breast 4 trial results came out, you can imagine the thoughts that were going on in the oncologist's mind. And it's, it's, it's something that, you know, you have to be able to know your lab's um, was your lab meeting the ischemic time? Was your lab meeting the fixation time? Was your lab validating the assay? What assay were they using? What antibody clone were they using? These are all important questions. And again, oncologists were knocking on our doors asking these questions. And if there was a doubt at any point, and if it was important to the patient's um, uh, prognosis, and if, if eligibility to TDXD was questionable, it was it's up to the pathologist and the oncologist to determine if it's worth repeating the stains on a fresh specimen. And as I mentioned, whenever you have historic specimens, you want to see what criteria was used. Um, and if you need to repeat the stains, make sure you use new blank slides because the antigen decay can occur on older slides. 
So the, it, it, it created, a, it kind of became a Pandora's box, but each institution had to figure it out between the oncologist and the pathologist, what was the right um, criteria used and what was the right thing to move forward. All right. Uh, thank you, Dr. Jaffer. So there is another question that I saw uh, that uh, how to not miss the hard to low cases, that meaning that how can we, what are your suggestions to improve inter-observer variability for hard to low cases? Uh, what would you suggest to our colleagues? So as I mentioned, you know, pathologists try their best to achieve concordance, but the interpretation of her 2 ic is subjective. It's operator dependent, it's experience dependent. And that's why the CAP update, uh, ASCO CAP update um, recommends that in case of doubt, to seek a second opinion. Don't be shy of that. I've been practicing breast pathology for 25 years now. I'm not shy to show my other breast pathology colleagues a case when I'm stumped, be it on an h &E level, be it on an IHC level. When the results are going to make such an impact to a patient, it's not your ego, it's the patient's um, uh, prognosis that's important. So anytime you are struggling with a cutoff value, you're struggling to, uh, is this zero or is this one plus, um, it's worth showing it to your colleague and figuring it out together, or even with a, a, a lot of other, you know, with, with a round table group of, of people. Because we saw amongst 18 breast specialized pathologists, they still had discordance amongst themselves, despite well-defined criteria. And then I showed you next that even after you educate these pathologists and you tell them we're specifically looking at the granularity of these reports, we still saw that there was some level of discordance between uh, pathologists. So I would advocate that anytime you have um, problems in scoring, get a second opinion. Thank you, Dr. Jaffer. So you mentioned uh, that uh, TDXD is also being tried on hard to zero cases, right? Hard to negative cases. So what is the current data that uh, to compare the efficacy of TDXD between hard to zero cases and hard to low cases. Can you can you throw some light on that? Sure. So the only data we have so far is from the Destiny, I'm sorry, from the DAISY trial, which as I showed on the picture before, while it was very significant amongst the HER2 positive patients, I, I believe it was 66%, um, in the HER2 low, it um, in, improved prognosis in 30%. And HER2 zero, it was actually also 30%, which then provokes the question, do we really need to be dividing, uh, you know, do we need to really care about scoring HER2 at all? Should we just go back to the way we were doing it, to the drawing board of HER2 negative and HER2 positive? Because regardless, um, the results were similar in the HER2 low and the HER2 uh, negative. And I went through why it was hypothesized that maybe the results were um, similar. But this is so far the only trial that's looking at it. Now, Destiny Breast 06, the results have not matured as yet, and we're all anxiously waiting. But they are also looking at HER2 zero and maybe some ultra low, because ultra low is defined by one plus less than 10%, which are kind of lumped into the HER2 zero negative uh, group. So we are waiting for those um, results to mature anxiously to see if the similar effect was seen. If so, we may be back again provoking the same question that do we really need to even um, segregate between HER2 negative and HER2 positive? All the patients um, should just get TDXD. It's, it's, is it really the miracle drug that we think it is? That's a very interesting observation, uh, Dr. Zaffer, that uh, maybe after some time that hard to low will not need to be reported at all. So, but it's still like, I mean, we have to do it as of now in 2024. Uh, there is another question that, uh, as you mentioned about the uh, tumor heterogeneity, uh, and because like it, the hard to can be low, even though in other areas, where, whereas like, you know, the it was negative in in the previous uh, sample. For example, if it if like uh, keeping that in mind, 
if your biopsy is negative, so do you recommend that the HER2 should be repeated in an exigent specimen? Maybe like we will detect HER2 low. What is your opinion on that? So to be politically correct, the ASCO cap guidelines from 2018 state that you should only report or repeat it. Uh, you, it says you may repeat it. As I said prior, prior to that, it was must repeat it, and then it was changed to may repeat it. Uh, from 2013 to 2018, and special scenarios that I went over. In my own personal uh, practice, um, anytime I have a HER2 negative on core biopsy, I will repeat it on the excision because, you know, uh, in case the tumor is HER2 heterogeneous, I want to be able to capture it on the excision, regardless of the scenario. And that's something that I advocate because um, if it's going to affect and uh, influence a patient's treatment, then I'm, you know, I am happy to repeat it on, on excision. Um, and, and for that matter, on any metastases that follow after the patient's uh, primary excision. So I, in my practice, I advocated, I teach that to my residents and fellows, and that's the way we practice it here at Northwell. Thank you so much, Dr. Jaffer. I think, uh... We have come to the end of the Q&A session. I don't see any more questions online, uh, but this was really great talk and uh, we learned a lot about this uh, uh, new kid on the block as of now, that is the hard to low breast cancers. And uh, I think our colleagues have all benefited from your discussion and uh, our recommendations. Dr. Zafra, you would be happy to know that we had uh, uh, colleagues from different parts of the world who joined the lecture. And I could see that uh, there were viewers who joined from uh, places as far as from Peru, Cambodia, Sudan, Saudi Arabia, Slovakia, Kazakhstan, Mexico, India, Nepal, Germany, to name a few. And thanks to our viewers for your support to Patchcast. And uh, uh, I would like to say that our next lecture is coming up on February 6th, uh, that is a Tuesday. And this will be the second lecture in our HIMPES lecture series. And uh, we will have a talk by uh, Dr. Jeffrey Madeiros from MD Anderson Cancer Center. And he is going to discuss diffuse large beads and lymphomas. And as always, please feel free to, I would say that uh, please follow podcast on the following uh, social media platforms. We have a website and please uh, feel free to follow us on Facebook, subscribe to Patcast YouTube channel and on X as well. And we have a um, what is it called channel on Instagram as well. So please feel free to follow as well. And thank you so much, Dr. Zafar, once again. So thanks for your time and we really appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Thank you.